It's a Saturday, so I'm not working. I've woken up a bit later, made myself a skinny mochaccino oat milk latte with extra turmeric, saturated my brain with unlikely guardian blind date pairings, and finally started varnishing that garden fence. Temper your varnishing enthusiasm. I use that fence. I don't want to slip. I thought you had nine lives. I used eight up in Nam. Wait, you were in Nam? That's right. Chippenham. When we look at all the other rights and freedoms grudgingly granted to workers after years of struggle, such as the vote, universal health care, a minimum wage, surely there was a great battle to win this privilege of the weekend. It turns out there wasn't. This is one of the rare occasions in radical history when the interests of workers and bosses aligned, even though they did so for opposing reasons. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we explore the heroes, the heroines and campaigns who won us the rights and freedoms of today. In ancient hunter-gatherer societies, downing tools on a Saturday could mean you missed the woolly mammoth and your family went hungry. You would do your hunting and gathering when food was available and when the light allowed, not because it was 9am on a Monday morning. Then in agricultural societies, seasons mattered more than weeks. You worked long days throughout the harvest, a lot less could be done in the winter. None of this had anything to do with the concept of a week, which came later. So, a year is the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. That's right. And the moon circles the Earth once every month. More or less. And a day correlates with a complete rotation of the Earth on its own axis. You've got it. Well, a week corresponds with the ineluctable cycle of my Mr. Frisky tamper-resistant feline food dispenser. The truth is, the week isn't based on any natural cycle. Nothing occurs every seven days. Agricultural societies did divide the months of the year into smaller units of time. In ancient Egypt, months were split into 10-day periods known as decans. It was the Babylonians who gave the number 7 significance, because they saw seven celestial bodies in the sky – the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And this led to the creation of a 7-day week. Nearby cultures such as the Jews, Persians and Greeks got on board with this idea, and from there it may even have reached India and China. In ancient Rome, weeks were were initially eight days long and ended on a market day on which children would be out of school and farmers would come to town to sell their produce. But under the influence of surrounding cultures, the Romans too switched to a seven-day week. Okay, so we can see how Western culture started the seven-day cycle. What about the time off part? The idea of a weekly rest day comes from the Old Testament. For Jews it was the Sabbath or Saturday, but early Christians began treating Sundays as a meeting day for worship because this was the day they believed Christ arose from the dead. In 321 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who'd converted to Christianity, declared, On the venerable day of the sun let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. Constantine's decree, along with the spread of Christianity throughout Europe, made Sunday the normal day of worship and rest. But even though people took time off to worship, working patterns were still mainly dictated by the agricultural seasons. That is, until the Industrial Revolution in Britain completely changed our relationship with time. While agricultural work depended on the weather and seasons, industrial factory work wasn't subject to these natural restraints. Machines, unlike animals, could operate day and night all week. And because work took place indoors under artificial light, nighttime didn't have to be a time of rest. The measurement of time was fiercely controlled by employers. A factory worker in 1850 actually said that he and his co-workers were afraid to get watches. It was no uncommon event to dismiss anyone who presumed to know too much about the science of horizon. The way people were paid changed too. They were paid by the hour rather than by their produce through the year. Whether you were employed in a factory or a shop, 100 hour working weeks became commonplace. In the race for productivity, employers kept their workers at their jobs for as long as possible. Time off for Sunday morning worship was still normal, because Christian observance was almost compulsory if you wanted to remain part of your community. Exhausted from their long hours of repetitive work, workers tried to enjoy the rest of the day. Socialising and drinking became regular Sunday activities. In Christian countries, where most people took Sundays off, occasionally the following Monday would be designated as a Saint's Day by the Church. Some British workers began missing work on Mondays more regularly, claiming that they were keeping Saint Monday. 
Since Sunday evening was the only time workers had to socialise, Mondays were a good time to deal with a splitting hangover. Its legacy is still with us. The 1871 Bank Holiday Act established certain annual holidays on Mondays. Although it was enjoyed by many workers, this unofficial Saint Monday habit infuriated others. Victorian social reformers, even though they wanted shorter days for workers, were often quite moralising Christians and hated all the drinking and gambling that took place in the name of religion. And employers were annoyed to lose a chunk of their workforce to hangovers each Monday. Employers wanted a more codified pattern for the weekend, something they could control and plan for. They proposed a half day's work ending at noon on Saturday, allowing Saturday afternoon and evening for fun, then Sunday to recover and, in theory, pray. This idea of a half day Saturday caught on among factory owners, who saw several advantages. Their workers would, in theory, show up fully fit on a Monday morning. The planned downtime gave them a chance to check and repair machinery, and the offer of more time off helped attract the best workers from their competitors. The one and a half day break took off from around 1870. In 1879, the English word weekend was used for the first time in print. In Staffordshire, if a person leaves home at the end of his week's work on a Saturday afternoon to spend the evening of Saturday and the following Sunday with friends at a distance, he is said to be spending his weekend at so-and-so. So, ironically, it was a push from employers to deal with the consequences of boozy Sundays and holiday Mondays that gave rise to the two-day weekend, in Britain at least. By the early 20th century, most British workers could expect to take a half day off on Saturday. In North America, some employers began giving all their employees two full days off over the weekend. This was to keep both Jews and Christians happy since neither group thought the other should be working on their holy day. But it was a particularly notorious American employer who, in the late 1920s, pushed the Western world towards a five-day working week. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, was a ruthless and controlling employer who paid spies to check on his workers' moral standards and quash trade unionism. He was also a virulent anti-Semite, which earned him a compliment from Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. In other ways, Ford was forward-looking. His car company was one of the first to routinely employ African Americans, minorities and disabled people, and workers at Ford were paid higher than market rates at the time, a decision that was taken without any union pressure. Most significantly of all, Ford helped to normalise the idea of the two-day weekend. On the 1st of May 1926, frontline workers at Ford began working five five-day weeks and were granted two full days of rest on Saturday and Sunday. That August, office workers at the company began the same pattern. This was in the face of severe criticism from employer organisations who feared the economic consequences, and even Christian groups who felt that leisure time on Saturday would somehow reduce the sanctity of Sundays. There were possible moral motivations behind Ford's decision. Ford's son Edsel told the New York Times in 1922, Every man needs more than one day a week for rest and recreation. The Ford company always has sought to promote ideal home life for its employees. We believe that in order to live properly, every man should have more time to spend with his family. But of course, there were commercial motivations too. Happier workers reduced turnover and absenteeism. Ford himself acknowledged that the five-day working week was expected to increase efficiency, with workers labouring more intensely across their shorter hours. He also saw potential benefits through consumerism. Leisure is an indispensable ingredient in a growing consumer market because working people need to have enough free time to find uses for consumer products, including automobiles. It is high time to rid ourselves of the notion that leisure time for workmen is either lost time or a class privilege. It would be easy to see this as part of a sinister capitalistic plan, that Ford was paying his workers more and giving them time off simply so they become robotic consumers of his own cars. But I think this would overstate the potential benefits to Ford. Even if some of his employees did decide to buy a Model T for use on their expanded weekends, clearly Ford employees were going to spend their cash and leisure time on other companies' products and services too. The only real way for Ford to make a return on the investment in his workforce was if employers as a whole decided to follow Ford's lead and normalise the two-day weekend. He had to accept this would take time if it happened at all. In the end, it took economic disaster to fully establish the weekend as we know it today. 
The Great Depression of the 1930s led to widespread job losses and falling wages in North America especially. Sacking people is tough, especially if your employees all live and work in the same community. Rather than let workers go who might be needed again during the next boom, employers decided to maintain headcounts and drop working hours instead. 40-hour, five-day working weeks became the norm. In 1938, the US Fair Labor Standards Act mandated 40 hours as the maximum working week. Even though the law said nothing about the weekend or days off, in practice, both employers and employees preferred to squeeze these 40 hours into five days of eight hours. In the UK, companies such as Boots adopted a similar strategy, preferring to reduce working days rather than sack workers. John Boot, chairman of the Boots Corporation, believed with Ford that two days off reduced absenteeism and had a positive impact on productivity. Even during the Second World War, when workers put in far more hours to support their their country's war efforts, it remained the norm to work longer shifts whilst maintaining the five-day working week. The two-day weekend had been an outlier in 1926, but by the end of the war in 1945, British and American workers expected to continue in jobs which gave them two days off in every seven. So who do we have to thank for your turmeric charge frappuccino and harebrain gardening projects? Some British drunks, a Nazi automobile manufacturer, and global economic disaster? Schrodinger, if you're very good and keep quiet, I'll refill your food dispenser while our audience watch this next video over here about the origins of British working class identity.